Good morning. Um, I uh, have to get started because there is, of course, a lot to be said uh, about Sigmund Freud. Uh, I actually, it's uh, a shame I have only 50 minutes for it and not uh, two or three uh, lectures. Uh, just before I get into uh, Freud, I just want to tell you that I did send uh, the questions already emailed it to you. So if you check your email, you have the questions for next Thursday. And I strongly encourage you to attend the lectures and the discussion sections. Uh, those questions are not necessarily very easy. So you, you may want to get more exposure beyond the readings uh, to have a good handle on it. And uh, let me just uh, very, very briefly come back to uh, Nietzsche uh, before we go on to Freud. Do I have enough on Freud? More than enough for today. Uh, but I would like to uh, still kind of wrap it up and to say what the bottom line is. And um, uh, the big question is, to start with, what is genealogical method? What is the new um, in uh, Nietzsche's approach? Um, and it should be clear from the writings and from the lecture and I think from the discussion sections right, that what he is suggesting that in the genealogical method uh, you will take um, um, an ideal and a moral principle, uh, what you think uh, is the right idea. And then he will show that one can think about this idea differently and historically they did think differently. And his major example is good. Uh, you think an idea of what good is, it's uncontestable, easy to agree. Well, I will show you that in history uh, the notion of good and its opposite, what is not good, has been constructed differently. Uh, so the point of departure, first of all, well, that is the Judeo-Christian morality of good and evil. I will show, I will go back to time, I go back to the antiquity, and I will show that, that the notion of good was completely different. Right? Uh, that is the genealogical method. Uh, but to do it consistently, he really should be claiming that going back to the antiquity, I'm not suggesting that the good in antiquity was the real good, right? It's just a comparative study which relativizes the idea of good in your mind today uh, to make uh, you aware that good has been thought about differently and different times. And in particular, of course, his main focus is on the notion of morality in modern society. And he said, well, there is something unique about this modern society, namely that morality somehow is internalized into us and we kind of accept our own subjugation and our oppression because these values are so, so deeply uh, invested into us. So that is in a way, right, the genealogical method. Uh, not to have, as I said in the lecture, a critical vantage point. Try to get away that I will give you the real universal definition of good and I will criticize any question of morality from a universal concept of morality. That's not what he does. Right? His major aim is uh, to show uh, that uh, uh, all moralities, all conceptions of moralities, all, all conceptions, uh, what is uh, um, uh, a justice, uh, uh, what is fair, what is humane, um, has been manufactured right, in the workshop of ideals. And this workshop of ideals is a dark place where actually coercion, torture, is being used to manufacture these seemingly great ideas. It's all about control, 
uh, over humans. That's in a nutshell, right, what Nietzsche is trying to do. So let me just make a step back uh, to Marx and foreshadow a step forward to Freud. So this Nietzsche has really little disagreement with Marx's theory of alienation. He said, well, as long as Marx is saying that in the modern world we are alienated because we are not masters of our own fate, I agree with him. Uh, right? We are alien in this world and we do not have power over our, our life. External conditions act like if it were nature, a thunderstorm, and determines our life. He agrees with this diagnosis, right, of modernity. His problem with Marx is that Marx comes to a solution, right? Mm -hmm. Marx says, well, I know what human emancipation will be, I know what good society will be, and I know who will get us there, right? The proletariat, and he said this is, uh, you know, uh, this is churlish, that's, that's no good, right? Um, uh, I, I won't do that. I won't fall into this trap, right? I will not manufacture another ideal because my workshop where ideas would be manufactured would be also a workshop which smells, right? And which is full with coercion and I would subject others to uh, um, um, uh, torture. Mental or physical torture? In the good old days, that was physical torture. Today, it's worse. It is mental torture, right? That's in a nutshell, right, what he's trying to, to achieve. Um, and, uh, of course, there is no Freud, there is no Weber, and there is no Michel Foucault. Uh, there is really no modern and postmodern social theory without Nietzsche's insight. This is a radicalization of critical theory, right? Critical theory, we've talked about this, right, from Hegel to Marx, was a critique of consciousness, that what is in our mind is a distortion of the reality, right? And therefore they were trying to subject human consciousness to critical scrutiny. Nietzsche does it the most radical way. He said, I am capable to show, right, the shortcomings of our consciousness without showing you what is the right consciousness, right? That's the project. Now, Sigmund Freud um, has a lot of similarities with this, right? He's also a critical theorist, and he says, well, what is in our mind comes very deep down from the repressed. And I will show you, right, um, how if this causes you neurotic responses, I can actually cure you. Uh, by the way, just I let you understand what has been repressed in your life experience, and then uh, you can do something about yourself. So that's in a nutshell Sigmund Freud's uh, uh, contribution. Uh, so it basically follows uh, closely uh, to um, uh, Nietzsche's ideas. And in the piece particularly what I ask you to read today, one of the pieces, right, uh, Civilization and this Discontent, he's struggling very much with the problem Nietzsche is struggling with. Uh, he shows modern civilization as repression, right? At the same time, he does not want to reject civilization, right? And he's tor tormented, right, uh, how to evaluate civilization, right? Um, uh, and, well, he probably is not um, going as far as, uh, uh, as Nietzsche, um, Nietzsche does. We will see that when it comes. Okay, this is uh, Sigmund Freud, um, and it's a good advertising. Don't smoke. Uh, you have his cigar. Uh, uh, he has actually oral cancer. He was suffering from it during the last 20 years of his life and eventually committed suicide. And the cancer obviously has something to do with his cigars. So don't smoke, right? Um, well, uh, Freud was one of the giants uh, um, of uh, 19th and early 20th century thought. Um, many people who would name the, the, the intellectual giants of this time 
uh, 19th century would name three names, Charles Darwin, Karl Marx, and Sigmund Freud, right? These are the three thinkers which made uh, rethink ourselves, who we are, um, where we come from, and uh, uh, what is the nature of the society we live in, the most radical ways. Okay, uh, let me talk very briefly about uh, uh, Freud's life. Uh, he was born in 1856 in what is now the Czech Republic, Moravia, southern part of the Czech Republic, in a small city called Pshibor. Um, uh, his father was a Jewish wool merchant. Um, he was uh, uh, already married to his third wife. He uh, was about 20 years uh, his junior. Uh, he was a pretty dominating figure. Uh, the mother was, uh, on the other hand, a very sensitive human being. Um, uh, in some ways, uh, uh, Freud's troubled relationship with the aging authoritarian father and with the soft-spoken, kind, forthcoming and warm mother does explain a lot about his thinking about uh, um, uh, human life. Uh, very soon after he was born, he, they moved away for Pribor. Uh, first, briefly, they were in Leipzig and then they moved to Vienna. And this is where uh, 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 Sigmund Freud received his education um, in 1873. He enrolled at the University of Vienna. He was studying law for a while. He got very bored with it, so he shifted into medical school and received his medical degree in 81 and worked in, to, in the major university hospital in Vienna, which is called General Hospital. Um, um, uh, in 85, uh, very briefly, he went to study uh, to Paris, uh, and this was very crucial for his change uh, because uh, he became interested here in neurology and especially became interested um, in a therapy, uh, what a French uh, psychiatrist was used and that was hypnosis uh, uh, to treat uh, hysteria. And uh, sort of he came back to Vienna and he decided that he will now become a neurologist interested particularly in hysteria and will use hypnosis uh, as a, a therapy. Um, he also married in 86 uh, as is a lifelong and, uh, you know, uh, very, uh, uh, peaceful marriage, uh, um, Marta Bernhardt, who was a granddaughter of the chief rabbi of uh, Hamburg. So he's coming from a deeply um, Jewish family, but he himself uh, had very little um, faith uh, um, in his life. He began to practice psychotherapy, and he saw, set up an office uh, in uh, Bergstracht's uh, Mainzin. Uh, 19 Bergstrasse in central Vienna. Here it is the house today where uh, Sigmund Freud uh, started to practice and practice there until 1938. And this is where psychoanalysis was born. So, uh, an important house. Um, so, um, after 86, right, he began to collaborate uh, uh, with another uh, psychologist, Joseph Breuer. And uh, Breuer uh, was not using the hypnotic, uh, uh, hypnotic, uh, uh, hypnotic method. Uh, what he did, uh, he did something what he called the talking cure. This is something what you occasionally do or your friends do with you, right? If something is on your chest, then you call your friend and you say, I need somebody to talk to, right? There is some, some real big, big trouble in you. You want somebody to listen, right? Now, this is exactly what Breuer did. He did ask his patients uh, to talk to him, right? And it turned out 
that this uh, talking cure was very effective. Uh, as you probably all experienced, right? When something is on your chest and you have a good friend who is willing to listen and does not rush to give you advice, right? This is whom you want, right? Just to listen and nod, to be sympathetic, um, and try to understand you and let you talk and ask the good questions, but not to give advice, right? That's what Breuer discovered. Well, in um, 1895, they co-authored the book, Studies in Hysteria. Um, and now they actually, in the book, suggest that there must be a new therapy. Don't put people asleep, but make them talk and let them freely associate. And through this free association, you throw words in and then they're beginning to freely associate to this world. You actually can uncover, they beginning to use the term unconscious. That is an unconscious level in every individual. And with this free association, you can dip into the unconscious. Um, and in fact, it was Freud who, in doing this, practicing this uh, with patients, uh, uh, also uh, began to understand that a lot of stuff in the subconscious is, has something to do with sexuality. That it is, you know, unsatisfied, unachieved sexual desires, which are kind of repressed into the subconscious. And then through these free associations, he was digging into the unconscious. He began to discover um, a lot of sexual stuff. Um, and then one year later, this right, a very important uh, uh, day in the history of modern social thought. In 1896, he finally has a name for what he does, and he calls it psychoanalysis. Um, uh, and uh, here it is. Uh, if you have not seen this picture yet, you should. This was the famous couch. That's where the patient had to lay down. And Freud was sitting in an armchair and uh, listening to what they got to say. Um, and uh, 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 asking just a couple of probing questions. Uh, but the essence of psychoanalysis is right, that you do not uh, solve the problem for the patient. The patient has to find its own solution. The psychoanalysis uh, will know what the problem is eventually, will lead you there, bring it from the subconscious into the conscious, and then it is as it becomes conscious, you suddenly realize you can deal with it. Um, now about the later work, just very briefly, it's uh, voluminous, uh, uh, in uh, uh, 1899, he published a book which is called Interpretation of Dreams. And uh, it's, to a large extent, uh, is analysis of his own dreams, uh, but also the dreams of some of his patients. Uh, his father just passed away, and with the death of the father, he had a great deal of guilt why he had this hate feeling of his father. It was a hate-love relationship, but uh, uh, strongly motivated by hate. Um, and uh, uh, he began to uh, analyze himself and trying to figure out what his problem with his father was and what his relationship with the mother and father was. And interpretation of dreams is a very important step in this direction. And the fundamental idea in this past-breaking book that, in fact, dreams are not accidental. Uh, dreams are the time of this little window of opportunity when some of the stuff from the unconscious tries to come up into the conscious. So therefore, what he did, he made people to remember their dreams, and then he tried to help them from the material which was surfacing from dreams to understand uh, their uh, subconscious. Uh, in 1905, there is another major breakthrough. He's publishing The Pathology of Everyday Life, um, in which you, you all know this term, the Freudian slippage, when somebody 
just by accident some, got something wrong, slips his tongue and says something differently than it should. Uh, Freud does uh, show that very often it's actually also the subconscious uh, putting his head up. And he, it is an indication what is in your subconscious, what is repressed in you. It was just not an error what you did, right? Beyond these errors, he can see uh, the subconscious coming up. And then, of course, the same year, another major breakthrough, probably next to the discovery of psychoanalysis, the most important breakthrough, the three essays on the theory of sexuality. And now he is moving towards what some will say call a pansexualist understanding of the mind. Uh, well, he's probably pushing it too far. Uh, most who are, do not believe in Freud. Though there are still many, many people who do believe in Freud, right? There are people who practice psychoanalysis. You know, just 10, 20 years ago, I mean, everybody has his, his analysts, right? Interestingly, I think somehow this is a little going out of fashion. But I think there are still people, you, you must know people, right, who have their analysts, right? And they go every, you know, other week to the analyst, lay down on the couch and, you know, they speak their mind and then they kind of relieve the, well, I would say, you know, if you have problems of depression, why don't you try it? <laughs> Actually, I think it certainly does you less damage than taking uh, uh, these bloody pills, what can, no, not, not, then, not, not that psychoanalysis cannot cause you trouble, because these psychoanalysts, of course, all know because of um, Freud's theory of uh, uh, sexuality, uh, that all these problems in us is uh, depressed sexual um, uh, desires, and it, everything has to do something with our early childhood experiences uh, for boys with uh, the love of your mother and uh, jealousy of your father. And um, uh, 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 right, uh, uh, and it goes uh, the other way around. Well, so if you go to an analyst uh, in no time, you will uh, start figuring out why you, you really hate your father or you hate your mother. Uh, and well, I'm not so sure that's the best thing what can happen to you. But anyway, that's what what he was doing. And he, uh, in fact, you know, he. Uh, um, discovers, uh, some, I think, an intriguing idea, and I think psychologists to this day are struggling with it, how much uh, truth there is to it, the so-called so -called Oedipus complex, and you know what Oedipus complex is. King Oedipus by accident marries his own wife, uh, or own mother, uh, when it turns out that uh, your mother, and that's of course a big tragedy, right? You are not supposed to this is incest, uh, which is the, uh, virtually all civilizations uh, prohibit incest. Um, well, and this is Oedipus complex that we are always uh, um, in love uh, uh, with uh, uh, our parents of the opposite sex uh, and jealous uh, of, uh, uh, of, of the other, uh, other parent. Uh, Right? And the Oedipus complex also means that we have a desire to kill our father in order to have the love, in fact, sexual love, uh, of our mother if we are boys and vice versa for girls. Well, I think everybody would agree this probably pushed the idea a bit too far, but that is clearly an interesting, very important insight uh, in the argument. Then, uh, in the later work, he is moving more towards metapsychology. Now he tries to explain the functioning of society rather than just individual psyche. Uh, the first major step in this direction is 1913, when he published the book Totem and Taboo. And this is about the origins um, of a fairly primitive society, the transformation from a kinship networks to a tribal, larger tribal society. And he ex explains in this book the origins of, uh, uh, you know, first complex society as the brothers come together and they kill their father. And the father exercised uh, in the kinship relationship absolute power and in fact 
Uh, he also believed that in these early kinship-based societies, there was even no incest taboo. So the father actually uh, could have sex uh, with um, uh, um, his daughters as well. Now, uh, the brothers come together, uh, they kill the father, and they create the first civilization. They're beginning to repress desires um, and uh, share um, uh, uh, power among themselves. Uh, that's uh, totem and taboo. Then uh, he writes two important uh, uh, conceptual pieces beyond the pleasure principle, 1920 and Ego and Id, and I ask you to read uh, some of it, 1923, which are kind of uh, important conceptual elements. Uh, and I think this all culminated in his uh, civilization and his discontent, 1930, which arguably, if you are not interested in individual psychology, but the theory of society, this is his most important book. was very big success and has not been out of print ever since. 38, he has to leave Vienna. He had um, a similar hate-love relationship to the city of Vienna as toward his father, as many people did. Uh, but by 38, uh, the Nazis took it over uh, Gestapo, actually um, interviewed uh, uh, his daughter, uh, beloved daughter, Anna, and sort of he, he saw the writing on the wall. It's time to leave. If you are Jewish, you don't want to live in the Third Reich. And he moves to London, and just a year later, he actually commits, commits suicide. It is an assisted suicide. Um, uh, his uh, doctor helped him uh, to get rid of the pain he was struggling with for a very long time. Well, a bit about the psychoanalytic movement. Freud's ideas were, of course, outrage outrageous ideas, very controversial. Nevertheless, very early on, already on 1902, there were a group of very young and able people, which included uh, people like Chandler Ferenczi and Carl Jung, and Ernst Jones, who wrote a wonderful uh, biography of uh, the definite biography of Freud, if you want, of course, a very pro Freudian uh, perspective. But read it, it's a great book. Um, uh, indeed. And they start together in Bergstrasse 19 um, in Vienna every Wednesday. This was called the Wednesday Psychological Circle. Uh, then in 1908, uh, this becomes uh, uh, the Vienna Psychological Society, a bit of a misnomer because in no time it's beginning to spread around the world and there are psychoanalytic societies all over the world until this very day. And if you want to become an analyst, it's not enough to have a medical degree. You have to go through years of very rigorous training um, uh, 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 what these uh, psychoanalytic societies will monitor. Uh, Freud was also a very uh, difficult person to get along. He basically f had uh, fallouts with everybody. First, probably the most important of his early associate, Adler, already in 1911, they break up. Then uh, with Jung, uh, you know, Adler, Jung next to Adler are the dominant figures of psychology in the first two or three decades uh, of the 20th century. Then even later on, he breaks with Ferenczi, who was a pretty loyal guy, it was not easy to get. Uh, a fallout with him, but you know, Freud managed this one. You know, he could make enemies everywhere. Okay, um, uh, then really the person who was running the show uh, 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 became uh, um, uh, his daughter Anna Freud, uh, who lived a long life uh, and uh, uh, hold up the torch uh, and carried the cause of psychoanalysis. So let me have a look at uh, the book on uh, the ego, not ergo, I'm sorry. It's the ego and id, right? Uh, this is a Freudian slippage, right? <laughs> uh, 
uh, I have to correct this one. Well, there are, he said, uh, here he is beginning to move. Uh, the uh, initial idea is that is subconscious or unconscious and conscious element what constitute the human sexuality. And now he wants to have a clearer conceptual apparatus to deal with this. And he has, well, our perception system has three components. One is the ego, uh, the other one is id, and the third one is superego. And we will deal with all of this, right? And therefore, what is interesting, what is the interaction between ego, id, and superego? And this content and civilization deals with this a great deal. It is also talking about the two classes of instincts, what guides life, and uh, that's also important for um, a civilization and this discontent. Well, he said, you know, initially we made a distinction between the conscious and the unconscious. Um, and uh, the idea of unconscious came from the theory of repression, that we have unconscious because some of the uh, experiences we do not recall, uh, for instance, our sexual desire towards our mother, which was prohibited, it's pushed into our subconscious, and other unpleasant experiences in our life we want to forget and we put into subconscious. That's repression. We repress, we repress an undesired experience. Uh, uh, here, unconscious right coincided uh, with what is latent and what wants to become conscious, wants to enter the conscious. It is only suppressed and it is psychoanalysis which helps you to bring this into the consciousness. But he said, well, uh, it's uh, all that is repressed is unconscious. That's, that's quite true, you know. Um, if you had bad memories, you, you tend to forget it and put it into the unconscious. But the big discovery was, uh, but not all uh, that is unconscious is necessarily repressed. There are stuff in the unconscious which was there before it was in consciousness. Uh, uh, he said the later, which is unconscious, only descriptively, not dynamically. Dynamically meant it was depressed. But there is an element of subconscious which is there only descriptively. Right? This is what, what he called pre-consciousness. Before, it, ne it was never in the conscious. Right? It is just deep down uh, in you. Um, and uh, well, uh, and he said we restrict the term unconscious to the dynamically unconscious repressed. And now the two, these the repressed unconscious and the pre-conscious together will constitute, I suppose, the it. Now we can now turn have different concepts. Now what Freud said conscious. Uh, pre-conscious and unconscious, and the question is, what is the relationship between those? So what is ego? He said, each individual, uh, there is a, a coherent organization of the mental process, uh, and this is what, what we call ego, right? Um, uh, well, it is to this ego that consciousness is attached. What is consciousness is us, is what is either goal. He said it is also a mental agency, right, which supervises uh, 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 and constitutes the process of thinking. Uh, he said which goes to sleep, but at the same time he exercises control even over your dreams. That's your ego. Um, and the ego is the agents of repression. The ego will repress stuff which is in the way of the ego to act, that will push it into the unconscious. Uh, well, he said, therefore, uh, our therapy was uh, to try to bring into the ego what was unconscious, right, and what was repressed. Um, but there is something else uh, which is not uh, repressed, which also has a very important drive, and this is it, right? 
it is what is deeply down in your, your those desires, the drives which come out of you, and they are not, some of it is not, has never been repressed. It is just by nature in you, the, for instance, she sexual drives, right? So I propose uh, the call, the entity which starts out from the system of pre-conscious and begins by the pre-conscious um, and the ego and call the other part of the mind into which this entity extends and which behaves through it as if it were unconscious, the it. It's unconscious but not repressed or a combination of repressed and pre-conscious. Well, uh, he said the ego is very sharply separated uh, from the id. Uh, it's really the id um, is uh, uh, below the ego. And that's a very, th this is probably the best to grasp. But he said the ego's relationship to the id is like a man on a horseback, right? After the rider is obliged to guide the horse where the horse wants to go, right? This is the id, right? So the ego will be in on the horse. Uh, the horse is the id, but occasionally if you don't want to follow the horse, you let the horse go where the horse wants to go, right? You try to control the horse, but there is so much you can do about the horse. It's a very important idea in uh, mature parts. And then there comes the superego, right? He said the ego is not merely a part of the id, right? Um, there also exists a grade in the ego, which may be called the ego ideal or the superego, right? And the part of this ego is firstly, firmly, uh, you know, firmly connected to the consciousness. Um, uh, um, and well, uh, the superego, right, as uh, the, he said, uh, and, uh, is part of uh, a residue of earlier object choices of the id. Um, uh, but it represents an energetic reaction formation against those choices. It, it is what tells you what you should be, not what you are. The ego tells you who you are, right? The ego tests the world of reality and tests what you can achieve under the conditions of reality, right? The superego is that part of your consciousness uh, which actually will tell you that what you should be, right? Adam Smith, you remember Adam Smith, the theory of moral sentiment. There is somebody inside you who is watching you and makes a judgment on you whether this is right or wrong. The idea of superego is very similar, right, uh, to uh, this Adam Smithian idea. Uh, well, psychoanalysis, he said, was uh, uh, criticized for ignoring the higher values in human life and talking only about sex and so, so on and so forth. He said this is all wrong. We are very aware of the existence of the superego. And there is a complex interaction between ego, id, and superego. Uh, well, an ego is essentially repressive. Uh, um, uh, it, 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 it essentially represents the external reality, the external world as such. Uh, the superego, on the other hand, represents the internal world. You own view what you would want to be, though you cannot be, partially because your drives are dirty, right? And your ego does not let you uh, to achieve that, right? Uh, so I actually what belong to the lowest part of the mental life, right? This suppressed stuff uh, um, uh, is turned into what is the highest in the human mind, right? The superego. Well, there are also two classes of instincts. One instinct, what he discovered early in the work, is uh, um, uh, uh, what he uh, 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 calls libido, uh, right? The sexual desire and the desire to live and survive and self-preservation. But there is another instinct in us. It discovers you somewhat later in life. And this is the death instinct, that 
thanatos. So there are eros and thanatos. One is what makes us live, the other is destructive, wants to bring us to death. And the human life and the human history can be understood as the struggle between the eros and thanatos uh, as such. Uh, sadism is a good example of uh, thanatos, uh, and he said. Uh, okay, uh, let me move to civilization and discontent. And there are the major highlights about ego development, uh, religion and purposes of life, uh, uh, civilization as restriction uh, of uh, sexual life, uh, 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 about ego development, there is not that much I have to add or interpret here. Uh, well, uh, he said, uh, um, uh, the ego eventually evolves in us. It's not just given in us, right? It sharply uh, d differentiated. I can say this person has a strong ego. You present your ego very strongly, and your id is being hidden uh, from, um, you know, if, I've, if I can um, uh, put it with Irving Goffman, right? The, the id is in the backstage. You don't show it, right? The id, what want, you want to present is, is your ego. Um, uh, uh, but this uh, evolves gradually, right, in the process of human development. You can see as ego gradually develops in a child and, and takes the form as it is. And one important uh, process in this as you move away from the pleasure principles to the reality principle, right? Is there a purpose of human life, he asked? Well, only religion can answer, talk to you about the purpose of life. Uh, I am as a psychologist or a social analyst or social scientist, I cannot tell you what the purpose of life is. What is the purpose of life now? He comes very close to the utilitarian idea, right? He almost here, um, uh, John Stuart Mill uh, be speaking to him. Happiness, we are all striving to be happy, right? But on the, unfortunately, the problem is that it is much easier to be unhappy than to be happy, right? Uh, uh, that, uh, and because we are confronted with the problems uh, uh, that, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, unhappiness is much likely to be our fate then achieve what we want to be, happiness. Uh, this uh, pleasure principle is transformed into a reality principle. We say, well, that is the reality what we have to accept. Um, uh, and we have to escape this. Uh, we, we, we need to have this reality principle to bring our unhappiness under control, uh, to be able to survive the sufferings. We have to have a sense of reality. And this is the Taming of the ego. This is a, now we come very close to Nietzsche, uh, as close as uh, uh, um, uh, Freud ever will be, right? And the sublimation of instinct. That's all what civilization is all about, right? The feeling of happiness is derived from the satisfaction of wild intellectual impulses, untamed by the ego. The blonde beast, right? That's where the real pleasure comes from. But it has to be tamed, right? It, here comes, right? Very much the Nietzschean idea. And this is happening uh, through the process, you know, um, if uh, one wants to escape it, then you, you do it, you become maniac uh, or intoxicated. You know, if you cannot um, uh, face the reality, then you drink, right? Uh, right? Uh, it was too much, so I go to the pub and I order a double scotch, right? And then I relax, right? Uh, intoxication is the way how to avoid reality. I get drunk. Uh, many people get drunk. Uh, very bad idea because actually it will make it worse. Your un unhappiness as soon as the first uh, uh, few minutes of happiness is passed will be just worse. Well, uh, and uh, uh, another way to do it is sublimation, right, of the instinct. You suppress 
and ennoble in some ways these instincts that were actually uh, the, you, you move into the sphere of fantasies. You fantasize rather than live out uh, your uh, depressed desires. And this is the mechanism of fantasy which creates art and science and the most noble human activities are actually sublimated, unsatisfied desires, right? Which came from the ego, the, uh, came from the id, the ego confronted with reality and then suppressed it and then was sublimated into these higher um, uh, um, elements. Well, uh, he has a very nice quotation from Goethe on uh, an unpublished poem and not uh, surprisingly unpublished. Uh, this says, uh, um, the people uh, who have uh, uh, science and art also do have religion. Um, those uh, who do not have either science or art have to have religion. Now, it's a very interesting idea. It's, uh, in fact, I don't think it is totally uh, obvious how you have to interpret, especially the first part. I think it's a way one can interpret the first sentence. Wer Wissenschaft und Kunst besitzt, hat auch Religion. Uh, it, ma it basically means, well, you know, science and art is a sort of a religion. And if you, you are actually a scientist or of an artist, you have your religion, you even don't have to be religious. But if you have no science or no, or, or no art, in order to make sense of the life, you need religion, right? And that's, I, I think it's a, not, not, not surprising that he never published a poem. Well, um, Freud pushes far. He is also anti-religious. Uh, and he said, well, indeed, religion is just mass delusion because it does create the impression, right, uh, that you can actually mold the reality, that there is purpose of life, probably not in this earth, but beyond that, and you will be able to achieve that. That's why he calls it mass delusion. You don't confront reality, right? You do not develop your reality principle sufficiently. Uh, um, and, of course, he also calls this uh, infantile. Infantile because you create the figure of the God, the Father God, and he said this is exactly the young infant's reaction how to respond to danger and the reality to hope that you will get protections from your father. And he said, this is exactly what religions are calling upon my, you know, when, when you address God as, as my father. Uh, okay, there are different sources uh, of unhappiness. Uh, um, uh, uh, first of all, the nature is source of our unhappiness, uh, is superior. And one part of nature is particularly source of unhappiness, our own body. And, you know, if you are getting sick and old like Freud did, you will appreciate more and more how much unhappiness comes from your body, what you don't necessarily feel right now. But wait 50 more years and you will. Uh, okay, uh, and that is the biggest unhappiness actually comes from human relations. Uh, so again, something which resembles uh, uh, very much uh, uh, the young Marx uh, alienation um, as uh, alienate from, hu from your um, fellow human being and of course uh, very much uh, to Nietzsche, right? Uh, that the problem is in, in human relations. Uh, um, well, uh, uh, now uh, the question is how on earth we can solve this problem of human relations. Uh, uh, and because we have this big problem, right, in human relations, people start blaming civilization, like, you know, Nietzsche did. Um, and, well, um, uh, uh, but he said it is in fact conceivable that men in earlier ages rather than in modernity actually were happier than they are today. Uh, uh, yeah, noble savages, right, the happiness in the state of nature, Rousseau. He said, well, that's not an unreasonable argument. But how does civilization develop? Uh, well, he said, suggests he's proceeding toward more and more control uh, over the external world, 
but also traverse extension of the number of people included in the community, therefore more and more control over other people, right? This is sort of civilization is a technology, how to be able to control more people, control nature and more people. Uh, yes, we already talked about uh, totem and taboo. You will see this uh, uh, on the internet. Uh, um, anyway, all culture, all civilizations are coming from repression, and this is a very important insight, very similar to Nietzsche's uh, critique, right, of morality. Um, and in particular, civilization restricts uh, uh, sexual life. Well, the important aim of civilization to bring many people together into a society and uh, uh, the uh, limit of uninhabited sexual love, right? Uh, it restricts sexual life. Uh, he said this was high mark was reached in Western European civilization. It's again almost, you read almost Nietzsche right here. Um, uh, a choice of uh, an object is restricted to the opposite sex uh, and the uh, most extra genital satisfaction are forbidden as perversion. Uh, but uh, even heterosexual genital uh, love is restricted. Only sexual relationship on the basis of solitary, indissoluble bond between one man and one woman is what is accepted in Western civilization, not in other civilization. And that is the most repressive system of sexuality, right? Uh, well, uh, uh, so, uh, right, and there is actually more to it rather than repression of sexuality, uh, you know. Uh, it has to uh, restrict all other kind of uh, drives which is coming from the id. It teaches you, uh, right, uh, to uh, uh, love your neighbor and even your enemy, which is uh, uh, in his view, right, uh, Im impossible. Uh, but, uh, well, uh, um, uh, we have to control somehow aggressivity. Homo hominem lupus, man is the um, wolf of man. Right? This is kind of Hobbesian theory of human nature. Right? Deeply down we are actually. There is also a critique of Marx. Marx thinks there is an easy solution. You eliminate private ownership and homo hominem lupus will be solved. He said this is naive. This does not happen. Well, I don't have time to work on this, um, uh, though it's a very interesting idea, narcissism and why you dislike particularly which is close to you. Uh, well, um, uh, uh, I think I probably just have to leave this here and just finish with the note uh, suggesting that uh, uh, he is actually very troubled. He shows the repressive nature of civilization, but he does not want to buy into the Nazi anti-civilization, right? And he said, well, um, I am not suggesting the superego is not necessary. Superego is necessary, but I'm concerned about the superego to be tyrannical, right? And let's try to find a middle way, right? in which let's not be naive, the id uh, uh, gives uh, bad impulses and they have to be controlled by the superego, but the superego can go too far and too much. So kind of tries to walk uh, a narrow way between Marx uh, and Nietzsche. All right, thank you.